Good morning, Bay Park Baptist Church family and friends. We thank you for joining us again this blessed Easter Sunday. So happy Easter. He is risen. He is risen indeed. It's an amazing opportunity that we have to join together. And even though we're separate, I think most of us know that tradition that when someone says he is risen, you respond with he is risen indeed. And I can just hear the voices of the saints cry out those words. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Well, it is a joyous occasion, and we are, are excited to celebrate the resurrection of our Savior. Uh, thank you to each and every one of you that tuned in for the Good Friday service on Friday. Uh, we're so thankful to be able to partner up with uh, several other churches across Saskatoon and uh, to still do that service together, even though we can't meet together physically. Uh, just by way of a, a couple of announcements to, uh, to mention this week. First off, I want to thank uh, Lee Walter for performing a, a few special pieces of music. Uh, if you haven't had opportunity to check them out, uh, look, at the, look for the playlist that should be below this video on the Facebook, uh, on the Facebook page. And uh, yeah, he performed three pieces that were included in our worship playlist over on YouTube. So thank you so much, Lee Walter, for your, your talents and your efforts and uh, blessing others through the gifts that God has given you. Um, there's a few other things to mention, too. And one, one thing that uh, we're not able to do because we aren't handing out bulletins, and I hadn't really thought about it until now, is we do still have church Churches of the Week and Missionaries of the Week. So I want to make mention of them. And if you can think to pray for them as you go about your week, uh, that would be very greatly appreciated. Uh, first off, our church ministry, our sister church ministry within Saskatchewan of the Week is uh, that over in Carry the Kettle. Uh, Carry the Kettle Ministries is run by Grant and Eddie Patty Moore, and they, they request your prayers this week. Uh, also, the Missionary of the Week is a fellow by the name of Paco Damian, and he works for uh, Hispanics for Christ in Mexico as a field coordinator. So please keep those, uh, those ministries and the, the people involved in mind as you pray throughout your week and even, even this morning. And uh, speaking of prayer, I think it would be appropriate if we did that right now. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for the day and for your goodness and for your love. I thank you for the opportunity we have to worship together this morning. And Father, I just pray that even though we are separate, I thank you, Father, for the unity that we share. And I thank you that you have enabled us to be able to worship together and not to, um, not, not to be so distant that we can't connect. But Father, you have enabled us to do that uh, through technology and, and other means. And I just thank you so much for, uh, for the resourcefulness of the, that you've given into people, Father, that we have these things available to us. So, Father, we want to pray for one another. We pray for those that are uh, maybe struggling a little bit in their isolation, Father, that you would just encourage, uh, encourage and uplift each and every one of us, Father, that you would keep us thinking well and keep our thoughts clear. And, uh, Father, I pray for those that might be struggling with depression or, or things like that. I pray that you would uplift their spirits, Father. Shine your light into the darkest places, even the darkest places within our minds, Father. And we want to pray for the, uh, the elderly, and we want to pray for those that are most vulnerable to this disease, Father, as there is an extra special uh, element to the, the potential for worry for them. I pray that you would just take that off of their shoulders, Father, that you would protect our, our most vulnerable, for protect our elderly from this illness as well as others, Father, that you would keep them healthy. And we pray for one another. Father, there's, there are other sicknesses and illnesses out there, and, and maybe some of us have them. We pray for healing for each and every one that uh, might be suffering from such things or injuries or, or, excuse me, whatever the case may be. Father, we pray that you would bring healing to our people, healing to our nation, healing to our land. And we want to pray especially for those uh, people in our, our communities that are working on the front lines, whether they're emergency services workers or, or, or things like that, or essential services workers. Father, we want to pray for them. We pray that you would protect them from this illness and uh, keep them safe in this time. And just once again, Father, as there is very much potential for worry, we pray against that. We pray that you would give us the hope that we need to uh, keep smiles on our faces. Father, thank you so much for the way in which you're working and moving uh, in our midst. And Father, we also want to lift up in prayer to you those ministries that we mentioned earlier. Father, for Carry the Kettle Ministries, thank you so much for Grant and Eddie Padamore's uh, long-term dedication out there. We pray that you would continue to bless them, take care of their needs as they continue to minister. And we want to lift up our missionary of the week, Paco Damien, as well. <clears throat> the work taking place in Hispanics for Christ in Mexico. Just uh, pray, pray that you would provide 
for, uh, for every need that might, might uh, come their way and uh, continue to enable them to minister to your glory, Father, that people would come to Christ, uh, Hispanics would come to Christ for you and through this ministry. Thank you so much for all these things we pray in Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> well, as part of service this morning, I want to invite you to open up your Bibles to Matthew chapter 28, verses 1 through 7. That's where we're going to spend most of our time this morning. Matthew chapter 28, verses 1 through 7. I'll give you a moment to turn there. Once again, Matthew 28, verses 1 through 7, and it says, After the Sabbath at dawn on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a violent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, and going to the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were as white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the woman, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. Come and see the place where he lay, then go quickly and tell his disciples. He has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him. Now I have told you. May the Lord add his blessings to the reading of his word this morning. Well, with it being Easter, and it is a blessed time indeed, I hope you've intentionally taken the time to make special memories with your family uh, that you're with and with maybe family that you're not with and friends. That you, you've taken the opportunity maybe to call up those loved ones and just give them that special greeting that comes at Easter time. And it has to be something intentional. And if by chance you haven't taken the time to do those intentional things and make it special, it's not too late. And I want to encourage you to do that. Well, part of that, I hope, maybe you'll get something from the message today that you can take with you. I hope and trust and pray that that will be the case. In our story this morning that we read through Scripture Narratively speaking, Good Friday has come and gone, and we find ourselves in a bizarre time in Scripture. This time between the promise of his resurrection and the fulfillment of that very same thing. Jesus was in the grave. All the events leading up to the death of Jesus on the cross I'm sure would have felt to the disciples much like it feels like to us, even if we were to read through it. It seems like it just happens in a flash, one thing after the other, just with a relentless pace of things happening to Jesus, horrible, horrifying things. But reading through the stories surrounding Jesus' resurrection, right here, the very beginning of Matthew chapter 28 there's almost a different tone to it all, a different pace, almost as though there's this eerie quiet that has just settled in over the words on the page, and as you imagine the things happening in your minds. Now don't get me wrong, the events that follow will pick up that pace again, and it will happen in rapid succession, and the, the things and the appearances and all these things just seem to snowball again. But right now, there's this different tone to the text leading up to the discovery of that empty tomb that Sunday morning. Now, attempting to put ourselves in the shoes of those in the stories, I would imagine it's easy for us to imagine how the woman would have felt going to the tomb that morning. They would have felt numb. Their, their friend, their mentor, this loved one of theirs had died. And the sur events surrounding it were horrible. They would have felt numb. Like they couldn't believe all that had happened. They couldn't believe that their friend was dead and yet they were going. They were going to visit the tomb. They wanted to pay their respects. They wanted to take care of the body as best as they were able. But what they see at the tomb literally changes the whole world forever. Because even till this day, we are still talking about it and will do so until the Lord returns. 
The natural order of creation has been upset, and he who was dead is dead no longer. He's no longer to be found in the grave. Now, I want to focus this morning mainly on Matthew's account, because it describes a conversation between this angel that appears and the two women that are there that day. Other gospel accounts have different recollections of how many women were there and the exact order of events. But like I said, for the most part, we're going to focus in on Matthew's gospel. The angel, in that conversation with the woman, said four things that changed the world. Four things that maybe will inspire us to do our part in carrying on that mission of changing the world. See, the resurrection of Jesus Christ changes everything. He gives hope to the hopeless. He gives faith to the faithless. He gives courage to the fearful. Blessings to the down and out. Healing to the broken. And restoration to all who ask for it. Now before I dive into the things that the angel said, I do like to set up the story a little bit and kind of go back before the parts in which we read just so that we know the context of everything that is going on. You see, the death of Jesus was a big deal, especially for those who orchestrated it. And I want you to think about that for a moment. Even those religious leaders and Pharisees and elders of the community that conspired together to put Jesus on the cross knew that the things Jesus said had significant impact and they were concerned because they knew that Jesus predicted his resurrection. If you go back into those final verses of chapter 27, you'll see what I'm talking about. His resurrection would make things worse for them. In fact, Matthew 27, verses uh, 62 to 66, if you were just to skim through those verses, you would see the chief priests and the Pharisees know that Jesus gives indication of his resurrection from the dead. Something that I wish the disciples would have picked up on a little bit better. But concerned about this and the implications for what that resurrection might mean, and yet still completely disbelieving the possibility of it, these enemies of Jesus approach Pilate again and ask and make requests that precautions be taken against the body being stolen. That was their concern. So they say, so give order for the tomb to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal the body and tell the people that he has been raised from the dead. And the last deception will be worse than the first. And Pilate agrees and says in verse 65, Take a guard, go and make the tomb as secure as you know how. So you can see we're setting the stage for what is taking place here. The Pharisees and the chief priests, they go to the tomb, they seal it with a large stone, they seal the stone in place, and they post a guard to make sure nothing happens to the body of Jesus. The stone that blocked the entrance was large enough that if you were to look at Mark's accounting of the scene where the women go to the tomb, you'll notice Mark 16, verse 3, if you want to write that reference down to check it out later, the women were concerned they wouldn't be able to remove the stone. They even said, who will roll the stone away from the entrance of the tomb? The tomb was secure as humanly possible, but that's the thing with this whole situation. We aren't talking about humanly possible. We are talking about a divinely appointed event, and greater things were taking place than any human mind could possibly comprehend at that, mind, at that moment. Now the first thing that we're going to look at this morning with regards to that conversation between the Marys and the angel, the first thing he says is, do not be afraid. Now, like I said, Matthew's Gospel only focuses on Mary Magdalene and the other Mary. There's a bunch of Marys, so I'm not entirely sure which one this is. It could be Martha's sister. I don't think it's, it's likely not Mary, uh, Jesus' mother, but there were a few Marys that they associated with. But as they came, Matthew 28, 2 indicates that a violent earthquake occurred because an angel of the Lord came down from heaven and he rolled back that stone, regardless of the seal that was put upon it, and regardless of the guards that were standing there. This angel rolls the stone aside and he sits upon it. The angel was a terrifying figure to behold and is described as having the appearance of like lightning and his clothes were as white as snow. 
quite often a description of angelic or heavenly being. Sometimes even used to describe Jesus himself. Now such a terrifying figure was this angel that the battle-ready, battle-hardened Roman guards posted at that tomb were so afraid that they shook violently and dropped down as though they were dead men. However, this angel is not to be feared by those who love Jesus. And the woman who came to the tomb, as I said, were told four things. And the first thing, as I've mentioned, is the angel says, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus who was crucified. There's a dividing line right there in that text between those who are looking for Jesus and those who aren't. Opponents of Christianity accuse us of being exclusivists. Basically, the claim that we have the only way to get to heaven. The world around us wants to pretend that all ways get there, but their accusations against us are every bit as true as what we say about how to get to heaven. We are exclusivists because Jesus is the only way to heaven. If what Jesus says in John 14, verse 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life, no one comes to the Father except through me. If that statement is true, then there really is no other option. And we really have no other option than to tell the world around us that all other ways lead to darkness, lead to hell. It's not how you get to heaven. You have to go through Jesus. That's the choice that we all must make here in this life. Otherwise, there won't be life for us beyond the grave. Not life in heaven, but in eternity in the lake of fire. We clearly teach what Jesus taught. Those who do not come through Jesus will not see heaven. They will not come to the Father. But the dividing line here at the tomb is illustrated so perfectly. In terms of fear, there's two examples. Those without God in their lives and those that were not there to find Jesus shook with fear, became like dead men. They were terrified, and so they should be. Even just coming face to face with an angel, let alone our risen Savior. Those with God, those with a heart searching for Jesus Christ, who are trying to seek him out, they are told that they do not need to be afraid. We have nothing to fear if our hearts are yearning and, and striving for Jesus. You see, if creation doesn't think it needs its creator, then it does have a lot to fear in his presence. But if his creation loves their creator and seeks for them with their whole heart, then they do not need to be afraid, not even of his messengers. The women were seeking Jesus. They came face to face with an angel and they did not need to be afraid because their hearts were in the right place. So what does that mean for us? If we're trying to find Jesus, we have nothing to fear. Moving on to the second thing the angel said, the angel tells the woman that the natural order of things has been broken. He who was dead is dead no longer. And verse 6, Matthew 28, verse 6, the angel tells the woman, He is not here. He has risen, just as he said. The second thing. As significant as Good Friday is, and the sacrifice that Jesus made on the cross, Easter Sunday is what gives us hope. You see, by raising from the dead, we are given the assurance that death has been defeated. You see, death itself is an adversary, an enemy that needed to be overcome. And in rising from the dead, Jesus boldly declares that he has done just that. <clears throat> there are many today who still want to find the body of Jesus lying in a tomb. They want to see Jesus as an ordinary person who lived an ordinary life, maybe significant teacher, but they still want him to be in that grave because that would mean he's just like you and me. And while he is like you and me, he is also much more. <coughs> As with the women who earnestly sought for Jesus among the dead, we know that he is not there. 
He's not lying in a tomb or a grave. Jesus is not among the dead. He has risen. The key difference between the women in the story and those today who would seek him in the grave is that the women truly want to find him. Are we like the women? I hope so. If we follow Jesus, we know not to go to the graveyard to find him because he is risen, he is alive. Can you see the difference? The women wanted to find Jesus, whereas those who want Jesus to be among the dead, they're not going to find him. They won't find him in the grave. If Jesus truly did rise from the grave, and here's where those who want him to be in the grave can't accept the fact that he is risen. If Jesus truly did rise from the dead, then that means everything that he said is true. And if it is true, there's a lot of people who will get very uncomfortable because they know they cannot stand in the presence of one who's told them that they need to do better. Jesus gave us some commands about how we are to live, and there's a lot of people out there not living by it. And I know in terms of sin, we Christians are fault prone. We sin like others, but Lord willing, through the grace of God and through asking for that forgiveness, we receive it, but we strive to do better. There are some that are comfortable in their sin and they want to stay there. They don't want what Jesus said to be true. And so they look for him in the grave. To us who believe, to we who strive to live our lives according to the word of God, Jesus' words are true. They are true and encouraging and powerful, and they are every bit alive today as they were when Jesus spoke them, because the one who spoke those words is alive. Jesus Christ is risen. You won't find him among the graves, in the tombs. But as you'll see in the next thing that the angel said, you must search for him with all your heart. And the loving, living Lord will speak to your heart and reveal himself to you. The third thing the angel said. The women that day were given an opportunity to do something the rest of us will never see. When the angel spoke to them, he told them, come and see the place where he lay. They were given an opportunity to see the empty grave for themselves physically. Jesus is not among the dead, for he has risen. This is a, something that is hard to believe, but the angel says, come and see for yourself so that you will believe. Those who search for Jesus among the dead, they don't want to discover that he has risen because you would have to accept his divinity. Those opponents today who don't want him to be alive, would they come and see the empty tomb if they had the opportunity? Would that change their minds or would they continue to make up other stories or excuses or think up other possibilities as to why the tomb might be empty? <coughs> <clears throat> Excuses still abound today as to why there was no body there. Here are four common excuses given for the empty tomb, as well as reasons why those excuses don't work. First off, some people think that Jesus didn't really die, but later revived. But you know that this excuse doesn't make sense for a number of reasons. If you're familiar at all with the Good Friday story, you know that a crucifixion is a particularly cruel form of execution. It's a way to kill people publicly and in disgrace. It was the Romans who executed Jesus just as, much, just as much as it was the Pharisees and religious leaders that made sure it happened. It was professional Roman soldiers who confirmed that Jesus had died on the cross, and if there was one thing a Roman soldier knew, it was whether a person was dead or not. If you recall, to speed along the executions because of the coming Sabbath, the, the coming celebrations, the soldiers broke the legs of the ones who were still living to speed along that process of dying. But when they came to Jesus, they saw there was no need because he had already died. And so they took that spear 
and they rammed it to his side, and blood and water flowed out. One thing we can be sure of is that Jesus was dead on Good Friday. Additionally, the abuse Jesus would have taken before and during the crucifixion would have been so great that if they were to somehow have that which Jesus didn't, they would have been too weak to deal with not only the heavy tombstone placed in front of the grave, the seal put upon the stone, but also the guards put into place. It would have been too weak. Jesus died on the cross on Good Friday. Second example or excuse as to why the tomb might be empty, some people think the woman went to the wrong tomb. Now, I admit that when it comes to visiting a graveyard, I have a hard time finding the tombstones of the ones I'm looking for. But the thing is, and the difference between my example and that of the women, is usually I'll come back after a year or longer to see where the, where the headstone is. And I've forgotten the exact location of one grave among many. But in the biblical narrative, we're clearly told, Matthew 27, verse 61, that Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, the exact same phrase used to describe the women going to the tomb that morning on Sunday, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary were sitting there opposite the tomb when Jesus' body was placed. They were there. They were there when he was placed in the tomb. They would have seen the stone rolled into place and the guard posted. They witnessed it. And it was a couple days later that they returned and they're having this conversation with the angel. They knew exactly where, it, where the tomb was. They would not have mistaken it for another. It's not one grave among many. It's a, it's a tomb. And there's a guard in front of it. And they knew exactly where to go. They would not have gone to the wrong tomb. There was no way. Third excuse for the empty tomb some people want to say that either thieves or the disciples stole the body. Now the problem with this argument is that there were armed Roman guards preventing that very thing from happening. Do thieves steal from guarded houses? Not likely. Thieves try for more convenient targets. The disciples with appointed interest in Jesus himself, were even less likely to have stolen the body because their demonstrations of faith in the resurrected Jesus Christ cannot be explained away if they stole the body. It just doesn't work. Historically speaking, each and every disciple, with the exception of Judas Iscariot, died and was severely punished for their faith. Everyone except for John was executed. John was sent into exile, which I guess in a sense is about the slowest possible execution because you're sent away until you die. But all of them were executed or exiled for their faith. Now, if you're protecting a lie, the truth is going to come out under severe examples like that. Peter hanging on the cross, not willing to die the same way as Jesus requested to be hung upside down, a number of the other disciples were, were crucified and put to death in various ways. All of them had opportunities to recant and tell the truth if the truth was something else. But the thing is, none of them did it, not a single one. So what they died for was not a lie. They were telling the truth. They knew that Jesus Christ raised from the dead. They saw him. They did not seal the body. That is not a possibility. Number four, some people think, well, a possible excuse why there was no body in the tomb is that the religious leaders stole the body, the very people that had plotted against him. Now, this argument falls apart very easily because if the religious authorities that put Jesus to death had the body, what better way to squash this up-and-coming movement of belief in a risen Savior than to produce the body of the one that they're believing to be risen? They didn't have the body. The reason why no one can produce the body of Jesus Christ is because that there is no body to produce. It's as simple as that. The words of the angel to the women that day are as true today as they were then. He is not here among the dead. He has risen. Come and see for yourselves. That's 
the third word of the angel, come and see. There are many resources you could use if you're curious and want to investigate further. There's many that have undertaken that task, even people opposed to the faith that have turned their lives around based on what they discovered as they honestly and earnestly sought for the truth. Lee Strobel is one such example. His book, The Case for Christ, I can recommend it as a resource that you can turn to and, and read for yourselves to present evidence as to why Jesus Christ is who he says he is, why he was raised from the dead. Another book that we've gone through recently in our small, small group, J. Warner Wallace's Cold Case Christianity. Additionally, if you're looking into defending your faith, apologetics might be something you want to look into. Now, apologetics is a, a very fancy word that basically means defending your faith. Men by the name of William Lane Craig and Ravi Zacharias, they're excellent teachers and apologists. You can, you can check them out and, and look into them and some of their books and writings. Uh, they both engaged in a number of def debates defending the faith, even against some of the preeminent atheists around that seek to attack it and bring these very arguments to the table. You can see for yourselves there is lots of evidence as to why there is no body in the, in the grave. But of course, we know and believe that Jesus is who he says he is. He is alive. Come and see for yourselves why the tomb was empty. You can still do that today. You might not be able to find the exact tomb. You know, some of us have gone to Israel to see things, and there's likely locations for it. But you can look for yourselves. You can examine the evidence. And you can discover the empty tomb. You can see and be assured that it is indeed empty. The evidence is out there for those willing to look for it. The fourth thing that the angel told the women that day is go quickly and tell his disciples. This is their special mission. Now, first of all, there is urgency to this instruction. Go quickly. Don't hesitate. Get out there. When it comes to telling people the good news about Jesus Christ, time is of the essence. You know, some of us wait, and we're waiting for that perfect opportunity, but maybe for some of us it's to our shame. We need to get out there. We just need to tell people. Make sure we don't miss out on those opportunities to tell our loved ones about Jesus Christ. Take those opportunities. Take those chances. Don't squander them. Don't let them slip away. Use those opportunities to give people every chance possible to respond to the gospel of Jesus Christ, especially our loved ones. We can't take any worldly possessions with us into heaven, but by the grace of God, we can tell our loved ones about Jesus, and maybe, should they accept him into their hearts as their personal Savior, at least we can take our friends and family. Go quickly and tell people about Jesus Christ. Easter is a time for families to connect, and even though it might look different during this COVID-19 pandemic, the connections we make mean all that much more because we are very intentional about how we make them. Today of all days, Easter Sunday, they might be more receptive than any other time during the year. The empty tomb is a powerful way to tell people that Jesus Christ is alive and he lives in each and every one of us. It might be for just such a time as this that God has allowed this to happen, what's going on in the world around us. That we would find opportunities to connect with our loved ones and finally share with them the good news about what Jesus has done in Scripture and in our lives. This is our wake-up call. This is our opportunity to reach out to our most receptive audience ever. Because people are looking for hope. And we have the ultimate hope in Jesus Christ. The commandment to go forth and make disciples of all nations. It's not reserved for a few people with a special spiritual gift. It's a command given to each and every one of us. Go quickly and tell others about Jesus. Just like the angel told Mary and the other Mary. Our friends and our families, they need to know and they need to know now.
And secondly, the women were sent to tell the disciples. So not only was there urgency, but there was a special assignment given to tell certain people. Our calling to tell people about Jesus is just as specific. Now, to be sure, evangelism can be a specialized spiritual gift. But the truth is that not every one of us is called to be a Billy Graham standing up on a, bo- a soapbox on a street corner preaching from there. Nor are we called to go in front of a, a podium in front of a stadium full of people. That's a special gifting of evangelism and not every one of us has it but each and every one of us is told to evangelize you see people are more likely to respond and listen to a loved one than they are to a stranger and that's true of a general conversation about nothing all that important but it's also true about the stories that impact our lives there's no greater story to tell a loved one than how your life is going and if Jesus is a part of that life, what, powerful, what a powerful way to tell others about Jesus. When it comes to our duty in telling people about Jesus, we must remember two things. First off, we are able to, we are able to share our faith only because of Jesus Christ. See, it was him in the first place that enabled us to respond to him and to become Christians. Secondly, those who respond to our stories can only do so through the working of the Holy Spirit in their lives. So it's all in God's hands whether the words we share with our loved ones will make a difference or not. But the thing is, we need to put them out there to tell people about Jesus. And maybe, just maybe, the Lord has been working in their lives in such a way that they respond. Family members who do not know about Jesus need to hear about him and what he did for us, and we need to be in prayer for them. We can pray for the Holy Spirit to prepare them to listen to the things that we can share with them. We are the ones who need to tell our friends and family about Jesus. That's what it comes down to. Now, this would have been a hard thing to do. You see, a woman's testimony in those days, it wasn't received all that well. It wasn't considered to be all that reliable. So what do you do when you have something to say, but people don't believe you? Tell them anyway. Don't let that stop you. Telling people about Jesus, we're never told that it's easy. I mean, it can be as easy as telling them about Jesus, but that's hard. That's hard sometimes. Very often, there will be obstacles to overcome. Now, thankfully for the women, the message that they were to pass along was very clear and very specific. The angel tells them, he has risen from the dead and is going ahead of you into Galilee. That's the message that they were to pass along. There you will see him. I think perhaps the women needed an extra little bit of encouragement because if you were to continue reading in Matthew 28, even the next two verses... It specifically tells us, as they hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy, suddenly Jesus appears to them himself. Jesus reveals himself to the women, according to Matthew's gospel here, so that they are not merely passing along a message from an angel, but now they see for themselves the risen Savior, Jesus Christ himself, standing before them. They've seen with their own eyes that Jesus is alive. Now they really have something to tell the disciples. They are able to share what they have seen, and regardless of the perception of a woman's testimony, that didn't matter because now they were excited to share the good news. And that's what it comes down to. Let our excitement override our fears. Our testimonies are powerful ways to tell people about Jesus. You see... As we bring this message to a close this morning, the message of the cross doesn't change. You see, Jesus died on Good Friday, but by Sunday morning, the tomb was empty. Praise the Lord, it was. Each and every one of us is faced with the same dilemma the women faced that Sunday when they saw the empty tomb. Do we listen to the words of the angel or do we walk away? Now, I want you to think about this. Of the four things that the angel said, They come at us in roughly the same order as well. If we fail to abide by the first command to not be afraid, 
How will we ever see the rest? If we don't listen to the words about Jesus not being there, he is not here, he is risen, how can we do the rest? And if we don't come and see for ourselves, how will we tell others about what we have discovered? We must experience the risen Savior for ourselves. And if we don't go and tell those who need to hear the message most, who will? The resurrection of Jesus Christ changes everything. And he gives hope to the hopeless, faith to the faithless, courage to the fearful, blessings to the down and out, healing to the broken, and restoration to those who need it most. The message of the cross stays the same throughout the generations. Jesus died for our sins. The promise is made through the blood of Jesus Christ, and we will get to experience the fulfillment of that promise someday with an eternity in heaven with God, face to face with our risen Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus foretold his death to his disciples. They had a hard time listening to it. They didn't comprehend it, even when he tried to tell them these things. But even the religious leaders, as we saw this morning, picked up on the hints that Jesus wouldn't stay dead. They took precautions to make sure nothing happened to the body, but it was all for naught. You see, a promise was made. There was a slight delay until the fulfillment of that promise. And today, we celebrate the fulfillment of the Easter promise. But in many ways, we are waiting on the fulfillment of the promise of what it all means for us. Philip Yancey speaks about this in his book, The Jesus I Never Knew. Now, the book is 25 years old, and some of the examples might be a little old. There might be some better ones. I'll share that in a moment. But Philip Yancey says this. Good Friday and Easter Sunday have earned names on the calendar. Yet in a real sense, we live on Saturday, the day with no name, what the disciples experienced in small scale, three days in grief over one man who died on a cross. We now live in a cosmic scale. Human history grinds on between the time of promise and fulfillment. Can we trust that God can make something holy and beautiful and good out of a world that includes Bosnia and Rwanda and inner city ghettos and jammed prisons in the richest nation on earth? It's Saturday on planet earth. Will Sunday ever come? Now, as I said, Yancey's book is about 25 years old, and I would add to this example the current pandemic. Do you trust that God can make something holy and beautiful and good out of a world that includes coronavirus? Today we celebrate Easter Sunday, and even though it feels like we live in that time between promise and fulfillment, know that the day is coming when all things will be made new. Let's make sure we are ready for when that day comes and that we've done everything we can to spread the good news. Jesus is risen. Tell our families, tell our friends. And let's hope and pray that they are ready for that fulfillment of the promise too. Let's pray together. Dear Heavenly Father, I thank you so much again for the day and for your goodness and for your love. And we pray, Father, as this is Easter Sunday, we pray that this spirit of your son's resurrection would just fill our hearts and fill our minds and get us excited about it. Father, just as the woman would have been to not only hear the good news that Jesus was no longer in the grave, but he was risen. But fill us with the excitement they would have seen when they saw him for themselves. And Father, give us that excitement where we just can't contain it, but that we have to let it out. And I pray that your son would continue to impact our lives in mighty and powerful ways, making the difference that we need in our lives. And I pray, Father, for others to witness it and desire the same things. Let your Holy Spirit be working in the lives of our loved ones, Father, that they too might receive your Son, Jesus Christ, as their personal Savior someday and someday soon. Be with us this day, we pray, and happy Easter, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Happy Easter. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Amen.